against two to one odds, we have not only beaten the Romans, but have pushed them out of Cisalpine Gaul, a feat of which even the ancient Etruscans couldn't accomplish. However, the Romans still remain an ever-present threat to our independence, and are no doubt planning to take revenge after their humiliating defeat. It has become very clear that in order for us to retain our sovereignty, we must oversee the complete destruction of the Roman state and the obliteration of their cherished city. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Impaired to Rome. And welcome back to Insubria. By the way, I haven't even finished editing the first episode to this, so... I'm really just invested in this campaign, and I really wanted to play it again, and I just cannot wait. So I'm just recording the second episode already. But that doesn't matter. I didn't even need to mention that to you, but... <laughs> of course, yeah, we're here back with the Insubrians, and we just got out of our war with the Romans. Yeah, that's what happened. So, yeah. That's pretty much that. And we might as well just continue on. Got some advances here. I think what I want to do is go down oratory. So I can get some more slots. Yeah. I need more diplo relation slots. I also want to come down here to tributary concession so that I can start making military marches. Let's see. We already got mines and those two precious metals. We have marble there. Cloth is also very good. Marble is good. 0.4. Cloth is also very good. 0.35. We have earthenware as well. 0.35. So pretty good trade goods that we have here. If we got foundries, we could be making a good amount of money. And that's going to be very important to increasing our income because that's what we absolutely need. I also do need vassals as well. Not only to get tributary... For not only get tribute from but to also get but to also export to right so i think probably just going down foundry and then after that i go down here i guess because i do really need to go down this Bitterigia really wants to ally me but i do not want to ally them considering they ally th they, th they border this the venetians are breaking their alliance with me and they've re-allied the Romans. Hmm. I wonder why they may be breaking their alliance with me. <laughs> they just fabricated claims on me. And there you go. The Istrians declared war on them, and they have no ally. What the fuck? <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. That's actually so funny. That is, that is genuinely hilarious. <laughs> that's that's so funny. That that's actually so funny. That is so funny. <laughs> the Phoenicians allied the Romans, and that gave them the confidence to plan my demise. And then immediately, I don't know when it happened actually, but they ended their alliance with me. The Romans ended their alliance with them, and then the Istrians attacked them. You just got absolutely outplayed by the Romans. That is Roman diplomacy at its finest right there. That is so unfortunate. Anyways, I'm going to invade you. And so, the invasion was launched in 231 BC. The Venetics fought valiantly, but were ultimately heavily outnumbered. And in just a few years, the entirety of Veneto had been occupied. Every major settlement and city within the region was sacked to the most extreme extent, carrying lots of goods, gold, and slaves into Insubria. Soon after, the tribes of the Lepontics in the Alps officially agreed to merge and consolidate with the Lepontic tribes of Insubria, giving birth to the Insubrian Federation. There were a total of five clans, three native to Insubria, and two newly added clans from the Alps Lepontics. The federation worked similarly to a republic, where each clan had their own representative that sat in Mediolanum to discuss and vote on various policies and issues on behalf of their respective clan. This system made sure that no one clan could gain too much power over another and encouraged cooperation and discussion 
to settle differences in clan meetings as opposed to settling them on the battlefield. This would be one of the main contributors to Insubria's relative stability, and is one of the main reasons why the Insubrians would never fall victim to a major civil war. Given our extensive commercial and cultural exchange with the Venetics, Ligurians, and especially the Etruscans, we have come to mix and adopt various Italic cultural and religious customs within our Celtic traditions. But with much of the Italic sphere coming into our direct rule, a demographic shift had started to occur within our clans. The religious traditions of the Celts and Italics had become so mixed that it became very hard to differentiate between them. Large swaths of the Insubrian elite, including multiple clan chiefs, began to jointly venerate Druidic and Italic gods, and in a few decades, the vast majority of members of all five clans would adopt Italic gods. However, much of the core population of Lepontics would remain firmly Druidic for many decades, but in time, even the general population would eventually come to adopt them. I... <laughs> I don't... I don't know if there's a conflict with one of my mods or something. I don't think that's the case. But... <laughs> the Romans declared war on the Samnites... And just gave them all of Southern Italy. I have no idea why or how that happened. By the way, I have... 86 maximum levies that I can bring up. Quite insane. Oh, that is an absolutely horrible console. I waited just for the moment they got a new console. Because their last one had 8 Marshall, this one has 2. This is perfect. The period of 218 to 203 BC saw the Insubrians clash with the Romans in two separate wars. The Insubrians invaded with a 40,000 strong army and met a force of around 30,000 Romans near the city of Cortona. The Insubrians had a significant advantage over the Romans. While the Romans fielded more cavalry thanks to their Etruscan auxiliaries, the Insubrians fielded a higher variety of units, including skirmishers like archers and javelinmen, a higher percentage of spearmen, which was used to counter the Etruscan cavalry, and a sizable amount of light infantry that were used to easily flank around the slow and heavy formations of the Roman legionaries. Not only that, but the chief of the Apatici clan, Crixus Apaticus, led the battle and was a very seasoned commander, who used superior skirmishing tactics to effortlessly flank around the tight bottleneck formations of the Romans. Both sides suffered heavy losses, but the Insubrians were the ultimate victors. The war came to an end in 214 BC, and in the peace treaty, the Romans were forced to hand over Dodecapolis and Tuscia, the whole land of the Etruscans, to Insubria. The Insubrians also reinstated the tribe of the Senones, the Gallic tribe that sacked the city of Rome way back in 390 BC. Several years later, conflict would resume. However, this time the Romans were joined by the Istrians and the recently liberated Senones. After a year-long siege, Rome had finally fallen, and on the 29th of November, 208 BC, Rome was once again sacked, almost two centuries after its first sacking. Soon, all of Roman mainland Italia had been occupied, and with the Senones and Istrians forced to become tributaries of Insubria, there was just one more thing that had to be done, extinguishing the final Roman holdouts in Corsica and Sardinia. For a year and a half, a navy was built for the invasion, and the admiral put in charge of the operation was a man called Ebus Moldio, a Venetic who had experience in pirate hunting in the Adriatic. Around 20,000 men landed on the island of Corsica, and it turned out that the Romans had little to no fortifications, nor any armies waiting for the Insubrians. In fact, Roman central authority all but collapsed on the islands, allowing for swift occupation. Finally, in 203, all Roman territories in Italia, Corsica, and Sardinia were annexed. After the process of integration of the Roman territories was complete, all the clan chiefs assembled a thousand men from each of their clans, returned to Rome, and had the local garrison open the gates. An abridged description of the events that took place was recorded by a member of the Dumni clan who partook in the sacking. Three days. The screaming didn't stop for three days. Everything was taken. 
Rome is no more. A few months later, a massive army was assembled to invade Carthaginian-occupied Ancona, where a 40,000-strong army was stationed and waiting to embark back to Carthage after partaking in their own invasion of Magna Graecia and Rome. The battle totaled around 87,000 combatants, and the commander in charge was a recently ascended chief of the Apatiki clan, Cavarius. He was even more tactically gifted than his predecessor, Crixus and effortlessly countered the shock tactics deployed by the Carthaginians, despite the Carthaginian army being considerably less heavily armored than their insubrian counterparts. The Carthaginians, being heavily outnumbered, would lose the battle and retreat in good order. However, they were followed very closely by the insubrians, and eventually, when the Carthaginians were unable to retreat further, they were completely massacred at Singulum. The city of Ancona, along with Carthaginian Sardinia, would be annexed shortly after following the aftermath of the destruction of the entire Carthaginian army in Italy. Central authority almost completely collapsed in Africa, and a political crisis took place where the Punic Republic of Hadrametum, amongst others, would gain independence. This was of great importance to Insubria. Hadrametum had now all of a sudden controlled the vast majority of arable land within Africa. An alliance between Hadrametum and Insubria was easily negotiated as both sides would stand to gain immensely from it. The Republic would be protected in case of war with the Carthaginians, and Insubria would gain trade rights to import the astronomical amount of grain produced in Africa, which was now needed more than ever to feed the heavily populated territories in Italia. Later on, a three-year campaign was launched in Illyria against the Istrians who had stopped sending auxiliary manpower to Insubria, an arrangement that had been agreed upon in exchange for protection. As a result, Istria was annexed directly, and their ally in the war, the Liburnian tribe of Edassa, forced into a client state status. Simultaneously, the administration of the island of Sardinia was handed over in full to the Sardinians, who had been consolidated into a single tribal federation by the Romans. They would remain loyal vassals of Insubria, being allowed complete self-rule in exchange for paying a yearly tribute and giving Insubria exclusive access to grain exports. I really just didn't, I, I'm dumb. I'm really stupid. I have actually completed the wealth of Italia. Has a monthly income greater or equal to 40. <laughs> I don't know why my, <laughs> I don't know why my brain didn't clock that it's just the actual overall income and not your profits it's counting the income that you're overall making minus the expenses it's not counting the expenses it's not counting the overall profit it's counting the overall income <laughs> if that had just crossed my mind at some point i would have just switched to free trade a long time ago oh man it's fine it's fine, it doesn't really matter. We could finally do it. As the latest economic reports come in, one thing is abundantly clear. Thanks to our newest acquisitions in Italia, we are making money hand over fist. <sighs> All right, there we go. Now we can move on to Italian culture. One of the six Italian cities with a population of at least 30. Lepontic dominant province culture and either form academy okay this is easy i can build form pretty much everywhere yeah i could do this i could do this there's definitely enough cities for that it's gonna take a while for me to do though i need to import papyrus and i get some innovations for free then in order to get republican yearnings we need stability 60 stability which shouldn't be too hard but we do also need the sack of rome and for that we need a turnum so we do eventually need to go to war with the Samnites here. But to be fair, honestly, the reason why I wasn't already, like, above 40 income was because my last ruler was absolutely horrible. He had two personality traits. He had two traits that lowered my tax income by 15%. It, it added a, it put a minus 25% or minus 15% malice to my 
tax income. So I really wasn't making any money at all for like the past 20, 30 years. But now finally, we actually have a better ruler. Doesn't have the best finesse, but at least doesn't have horrible traits. So we're actually making a lot of money now. All right, there we go. What's telling culture done? We've decided to undertake a grand building initiative, one with express purpose of bolstering and strengthening culture in our cities. We have the economic means to do so, making this an imperative matter for the betterment of our society. That's a lot of reading. Can we get Papyrus? Unfortunately, no. I don't even know where Papyrus is. Oh, it is impossible to see. That is so counterintuitive, that color. But it seems to be... <laughs> There's a single one in Iberia. There are none in North Africa. Oh, wait, there technically is, but they're all in Egypt. <laughs> There's some in Anatolia as well. Yeah, that's just not happening, man. Despite relatively calm relations with the Samnites, the Insubrians sensed a looming threat from the rising Republic. Out of fear of seeing a Roman-like threat rise from Magna Graecia, Insubria launched a preemptive invasion to cut the burgeoning Samnite Republic down to size. The armies marched in on the 7th of September, 181 BC. It was the single largest ground invasion in Insubrian history, with an army numbering around 79,000 without mercenaries. The Battle of Histonium was the first battle of the war, and was the largest battle in both Insubrian and Samnite history, with an astounding 114,000 total combatants. The battle was led by the greatest commander of the era, Cavarinus Epaticus, a name you have no doubt heard before, and one which will soon become a legend amongst his contemporaries, as his strategic exploits and great military victories in the Samnite War solidified in Subrian dominance of the Italian peninsula. In a battle where Cavarinus was initially heavily outnumbered, he still managed to defeat the Samnites, with the Samnites losing around 20,000 men, an amount they simply could not afford to lose. Afterwards, four more decisive battles were fought, all of which resulting in an insubrian victory. And after three years, the Samnites had enough and sued for peace. The province of Aeternum was directly incorporated into Insubria, while various republics friendly to Insubria were propped up in the territories it occupied. The Samnites were also forced to abandon their garrisons in Sicily, and Insubrian diplomats were sent to the city of Akragas, to ratify a constitution for the city. This would eventually give birth to the Republic of Akragas, and three years later, the Republic of Sicily would be proclaimed after central authority had been re-established throughout much of the island. We have heard from other Celtic raiders that the Romans are wealthy cowards, with cities and towns of magnificent wealth that they can hardly defend. The promise of eternal glory beckons. We will take their homes from them. Our latest war has drawn to an end and the news of our victory has spread far and wide, traveling far beyond the shores of Italia. There are some who cannot believe that we have defeated the Romans, claiming that such a mighty republic would never fall to mere barbarians. To all doubters, we extend an invitation. Come to the city on the banks of the Tiber, and see who controls the city gates. Now that we have burned the Roman Republic to ashes, we have decisions to make. Let's resettle Rome. Now we can actually become a republic, we just need stability. So really, we just need to get lucky with events. That's pretty much it. There are voices, particularly among the wealthiest in our society, that are clamoring for a change in government. Stating that, we have outgrown our humble roots. They argue that we can acknowledge where we come from while entrusting the best among us to lead us to future glories. And I will draw your attention, Avitus, to the fact that our current form of governance is untenable. What once worked for our ancestors cannot work for their grandchildren, who are the masters of much more than the mountains. Yet no easy solution presents itself to us. The air is stifling and hot where the council is meeting, an unpleasant reality that the nobles gathered inside have grown accustomed to. There is palpable relief in the room when Avitus Coreus waves a hand, signaling that the debate has ended. Perhaps the time has come for a change. Rising to his feet, Avitus quietly says, We could emulate the ways of those around us, 
the nobility shall formally continue to lead us to glory. And there we go, we are now finally a republic. And we immediately got an election and we have unpopular consul, that's cool. <laughs> Great, and here we are, Comius Epaticus, who is literally about to die, is our first ever Archon. Doesn't it make more sense that we become an oligarchy anyways, considering, you know, that the society was already an oligarchy? So I, I feel like, honestly, in the mission, it should make you an oligarchic republic, not an aristocratic one. What? Whatever, it doesn't really matter. Secure a rule, we need a bunch of PI again, and a bunch of stability again. All party leaders need to have more than 70 loyalty. Then we need Southern Italia, then Strait of Messene. Then we are pretty much done. The Insubrian Senate elected its first ever ruler in 174 BC, Guiderius Audaxus. The elected head of state would bear the title of Consul, the name for chief magistrate the Romans used. In fact, the overall government structure of the Republic had largely been adopted from the Romans and Etruscans. There would always be two consuls at any given time, as a precaution to make sure that not one consul could obtain too much power. However, the Insubrians deferred to the Romans in terms of term length. While the Romans elected a new consul every year, an Insubrian consul kept his position for five years allowing the chief magistrate to properly see through state development projects and the enacting of policies that may take an extended period of time. Mandatory military service was the first state policy enacted by Guiderius. All able-bodied men were expected to serve in the military. This vastly increased the manpower pool of the state, allowing for it to partake in large-scale warfare. As it became increasingly more important to support overseas allies, and to protect the crucial grain imports from Sicily and Africa, permanent shipyards were constructed across the Republic in order to vastly increase the output of vessels of war. These shipyards would prove to be vital in later Macedonian and Punic Wars. Alongside the creation of new shipyards, Guiderius oversaw the formation of an alliance with the city of Regium. The alliance was important to protect trade going through the Fretum Seculum, but also in case of war with the Nucarian Republic who had an alliance with the Sicilians. Regium acted as a formidable obstacle, halting any Sicilian advances through southern Italy. The Senate was largely dominated by the oligarchs, a party that consisted primarily of the wealthy elites and aristocrats that want nothing more than to further enshrine their status and power. The next party with a considerable amount of seats were the Democrats, who wished to protect the rights of citizens, non-citizens, and the disenfranchised, and preserving political balance and equity within the state. The third and final party, the Traditionalist Party, held basically no power at the beginning, but would slowly grow in number over the coming decades. Despite being an oligarch himself, Guiderius sought to gain more overall approval from the Senate by directly advocating for legal reforms to garner more favor from the Democrats, while also handing out lands to wealthy aristocrats to gain more support from the oligarchs. Guiderius's consulship ended in 169, and Tasgetius Corius, a Democrat, was elected as the new consul until 164. The very first issue he had to respond to was the food crisis in Tuscia. The developing situation had all but been ignored by Guiderius and the oligarchs, and instead of immediately dealing with the increasing shortage of food, the elites in the region who had owned much of the food and grain instead chose to greedily raise the price, knowing that people would be desperate enough to pay. The cause of the grain shortage was due to an oversight in bureaucracy, where Tuscia apparently wasn't receiving enough shipments from Sardinia and Hadrametum, whereas the surrounding provinces were adequately supplied. Tasgetius created a new bureaucracy in the province, and immediately made agreements to import grain, while also allocating state funds towards the expansion and building of new farming settlements to increase the domestic output of grain and livestock. The whole ordeal further tightened the reliance on the importing of grain from Hadrametum further tightening the mutual bond between the two states. The situation began to stabilize in Tuscia near the end of Tasgetius's consulship, but not after thousands of easily avoidable deaths from famine. With the city-state of Regium being increasingly reliant on food imports from Sardinia, they would eventually fall into a client-state relationship within Subria, 
where in exchange for protection and reduced tariffs, Regium was allowed greater access to the grain import deal between Insubria and Hadrametum. The consul elected in 164 was a man named Adiatuanus, an oligarch also belonging to the Koreos family. He was a relatively unpopular consul, mostly due to him winning the election by a slim margin, despite the Democrats controlling the majority of seats by this point. Another possibility for his unpopularity amongst the people could be from the fact that he was the son of a once prominent Roman senator who held blood ties with the gens Cornelia and the gens Claudia. Whatever the case, Adiotuanus' consulship was defined by diplomatic and military expansion outside of the Italian peninsula. In the very first year, client-state relations were diplomatically established with the Hellenic Illyrian Republic of Issa, while the Senate unanimously approved an invasion across the Western Alps into the Saluvian tribe of Vocontia as a safeguard against the growing Aquitanian threat. In November of that same year, word reached Mediolanum that multiple armies flying Macedonian colors were seen marching on Insubria's Illyrian allies and had begun seizing strategic forts and occupying various cities and locations in the region. Luckily, only a few months later, the invasion of Vocontia was successful, and Insubia could fully focus on the east. During these events, Adiotuanus spent most of his time lobbying and advocating for the passing of a bill to reform the military, as he and many others within the military did not believe that the army and state apparatus as a whole was sufficiently equipped to engage in long, large-scale warfare, something that the state would need to be prepared for if it wished to protect itself from growing external threats like the Aquitanians and the Macedonians. Such a bill was eventually passed on the 25th of September 163 BC. Dubbed the Korean Reforms, it would amongst other things vastly increase the pool of accessible manpower from the Insubrian population by extending the scope of conscription to all free men of the Republic. The Venetics, Umbrians, Romans, Sinonians, Sibelians, and Istrians were now expected to serve in the military, a privilege that was previously only given to the Lepontics, Ligurians, and Etruscans, who were official citizens. The mercenary captain Messor and his army of Illyrians was likely the largest contributing factor to Insubrian success on the Illyrian front. He was a general of unprecedented skill, often compared to the likes of Cavernus and Crixus. He defeated every Macedonian army he faced, allowing for a large-scale counteroffensive. The Macedonians attempted to divert attention to Italia by landing multiple armies in the region, first on the east coast and then on the west. The naval invasions ultimately amounted to nothing, and the armies were completely destroyed by the consular army. By 161 BC, a new front had opened up when Etruscan mercenaries were sent to invade the Peloponnese and rile up the local Greek population to revolt against their Macedonian overlords. While the invasion didn't cause immediate upheaval amongst the Greeks, it did succeed in diverting Macedonian armies from the Illyrian front. At this point, the Insubrians had reached Epirus and were planning to link up with the Etruscans in the Peloponnese when they were engaged by a 37,000 strong Macedonian army, the largest they could muster. The Macedonians were substantially more disciplined in battle and accomplished a victory, but not before taking over 12,000 in casualties around 4,000 more than in Subria, despite outnumbering them. This was then followed by another major battle that took place in Olympia that also resulted in the Macedonian victory. The Macedonians used these victories as leverage to sue for peace, and so on the 30th of April, 160 BC, peace was established. In the peace terms, the Macedonians were forced to transfer all of their Illyrian territories to the Republic of Issa, while also being forced to relinquish some territory in the Peloponnese to various city-state republics. After the conflict with the Macedonians finally came to an end, new republics friendly to Insubria were created. The policy of creating allied republics in conquered lands would be a continued strategy used as justification to label Insubria as liberators. After diplomatic relations had soured between Nuceria and Sicily, the new consul, Inamicus, saw this as the perfect time to attack as the Nuceriaans were an ever-present threat to Regium. A year and a half later, the Nusarians and the last remnants of the Samnite Republic, who were their ally, were conquered, with Insubrian allied republics being propped up in the region. The year of 151 BC was a monumentous moment in Insubrian history. 
due to the expansion of its sphere of influence, and Zubrian merchants began to venture east along the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. For the first time, they reached the coast of southern Anatolia, the ancient cities of the Levant, and eventually the great Hellenic city of Alexandria, the capital of Ptolemaic Egypt. Egypt was especially important for the production of papyrus, a thick paper-like material primarily used for writing, and Subrian merchants began to buy this revolutionary product in bulk and return home with it. With every new shipment of papyrus, more and more copies of important documents, and various texts that we have come into possession of were made. These copies would be stored in a vast library in Mediolanum, increasing the available knowledge to our elites. Kimarchus Elatovis, the new consul of 144 BC, made a speech to the Senate in acknowledgement of his election. He talked about many things in the speech, but the most important part was in how he addressed the new Insubrian Federation. While Insubria itself was the central governing polity in the political institution, being in charge of directing foreign policy like external trade, the declaration of war, and establishing peace treaties and alliances, the other republic subordinate to Insubria enjoyed a great deal of autonomy, being allowed to create and govern within their own laws, freely practice their own native religious traditions, and even raise their own armies and navies in times of war. The Republic of Sicily had recently been welcomed into the Federation, due to a democratic referendum that decided in favor of joining. More republics in the future would either willingly or otherwise come to find themselves a part of this new political entity. After expansion into the northeastern Alps as a safeguard against barbarian invasions, Insubria would volunteer itself in the Carthaginian Civil War, and after a seven-year conflict, Carthage lost all of Africa and nearly all of Numidia, while the Federation gained new members along the Numidian coastline. Meanwhile, Hadramatum, still allied to Insubria, replaced the power vacuum in Africa. Our eyes tear up at the sight of Mediolanum the home of our people. When we first set eyes upon this site, it was barely a fortification, a half-broken tower in the middle of a beautiful plain. Over the years, our chiefs and then consuls have done much for this city, and there are no cities in Italia that can rival her elegance and charm. No matter where one travels from, be it Rome, Croton, Neapolis, or any countless other city, what they say is true. Every road leads to Mediolanum, for there is no other reason to leave home besides seeing this city of dreams. That is the Insubrian campaign complete. This was a very enjoyable campaign, and I am satisfied with calling it here because we have completed the mission tree. The core of the Federation, you could say, is the Insubrian Republic. That is true, but there are other republics that consist of one whole, I guess. All of them have self-rule, self-governance, they can make their own laws and whatnot, but they all still, for the most part, answer to one central republic and all in tandem cooperate with each other within the Federation. As you can see here, these, these are all of my vassals and allies. These guys up here are feudatories, some, just some Gallic tribes that were near me that I just diplo vassalized. Of course, we have the Illyrian Republics, we have the various Southern Italic Republics, we have Sicily, we have the Republic of Sardinia, the Republic of Massalia, which is a Saluvian Republic. Then we have the various African republics. Then we have our ally in Hadramatum and Massilia. In my head canon, eventually Hadramatum will agree to join the Federation, but for now they will remain independent. First of all, actually first I'm going to show you the atlas before I forget. I'm going to show you the atlas because I've done some road building. I haven't like completed it, but it's pretty extensive throughout all of Italy, connecting everything. Of course, all roads lead to Mediolanum. Next, I guess we look at culture here. Let's look at Lepontic. Essentially, Lepontic is all over the Republic itself, which makes sense. Ligurians are still integrated. Etruscans are still integrated. The Romans aren't integrated, and they have, like, all of Latium has been completely assimilated, essentially. It's mostly Italic. There's still a lot of Druidic 
loadouts here. The most, for the most part, that's because for the longest time I ha I had three, or for the longest time I had two druidic deities. I only just recently, like probably like ten years ago, got rid of another one, and now we're down to only one more. Let's then look at our population. In total, we have 2,811 pops. Comparing that to others around us, still n not a lot. <laughs> it's really not a lot, but wow, I didn't even know the ant antipatches had 5,000 pops. We'll look, around at the, we'll look around the world a little bit here. 1,000 Lepontics, 450 Etruscans, 233 Ligurians, still a lot of Romans around. As for religion, we are 72% Italic and 19% Druidic. Probably should have looked at this as well. We are 46% Italic and 41% Gallic. Mostly slaves, a lot of freemen, citizens, not a lot of nobles at all. Our income, almost 90 overall income. Make a lot from commerce. I haven't actually switched to free trade, but I, I'm still making so much money even without free trade. Don't make that much from tributes because I don't actually have much client states or tributaries. If you don't know, if you hadn't already noticed or guessed, these only, as you can see here, actually it's only Sicily and Issa that are paying tribute because those are my only client states. These are actually my only client states. The rest of these guys, these republics here, are marches. Look, in the military, we have a large army. We have just a massive army. Here's our navy right here. Traditions, but we've gone down. These are the traditions. We haven't gone down much. We're in 127 BC. I think that's it. I'm pretty sure. Oh, I guess I, I did already show you the capital, I think, but I'll show you here. And yeah, let's look around the world now. For the longest time, the Cherudians have just been here, just chilling, <laughs> just at there. There's they were they've been at this size for pretty much the entire game. Britannia, I don't even know when that formed, but I noticed it like probably like seventy years ago. So they've been here just chilling as well. The Vasconians just going insane. They got antagonistic nation which is why they're so big also the trudians i really honestly expected them to attack me at some point but they didn't which i'm very surprised about they never attacked me <laughs> which is very very surprising of course we have the carthaginians who are not feeling well then over here we have the antipatris who have for the longest time been an antagonistic nation we did go to war with them one time and it did not go well for them. Scythia is here, also antagonistic. These guys, I, yep, they are also antagonistic. The Atropatid Kingdom here, which is still so amazing that the Atropatids actually usurped the Seleucids. Unfortunately, they don't have their bloodline. I think I, I think they do have their bloodline in the realm. They just, the ruling, the royal family doesn't have the bloodline. Currently, I'm with the Tomeks, who are very strong as always then there's kush also makes a fighting a large two front war that's interesting these are the lichians Keterites. okay iran has just been a mess for the longest time and then there's this <laughs> the pandia have just completely conquered all of india <laughs> as you do thank you for making it to the end thank you for joining me and I do hope you enjoyed. It's been Alton, signing out. See ya.